in the interest of time, I would just mention very quickly some of the samplings of the jobs of our graduate graduates. We have the Regional Administrator for the U.S. Department of Labor, Region 1, Women's Pearls. We have many state representatives. We have those who are supervisors for equity, strategic partnerships, and workforce development, um, managers of legislative affairs, directors of communication, um, you know, we have those who have won awards, recipients of the Latino 30 Under 30 Award. Um, just, I could go on and on, but again, we have an incredible um, you know, students doing very, very incredible things. Um, in addition to that, um, I could go on and on in terms of some of the internships, but I'll leave that for, um, for Muna to highlight later. Again, I'm really, really very excited to offer you the opportunity to apply for the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program and get involved in all the things that we do at the center, because that's one of the pluses of being a student in GLPP program is that you can take advantage of all the ways in which we engage with the public and with our students in the university more broadly um, as something that would be very, very beneficial to you. So I, at that point, what I'm more and more and more excited about doing is to um, introduce um, Representative Liz Miranda. Um, Jack, do we have um, Senator Miranda's um, bio um, on the chat so that everybody can um, also read it at the same time? Yep, I'm about to post it. Okay, great. I'm really, really excited to say the least to have Senator Miranda to speak to us today. She has been so gracious with her support of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy um, with the McCormick School more broadly. And clearly we all know all the work that she's done within the community. So I, I want to say that I am incredibly, you know, um, grateful that you've taken time out of your incredibly busy schedule to be with us, um, be, be with us this evening. Good evening, how are you? Can you guys see me? Yes, we can. More importantly, hear from me. And uh, before I start my remarks, I just want to say, I make a joke. I'm a politician, so I'll probably talk longer uh, than most of the people who have spoken, but I hope that it's uh, worthwhile. But I want to thank uh, Celia. It's great to see you. The work that you've done with Maywalk. I saw uh, Representative Charlotte Golarichi, who was my representative uh, mm -hmm. when I was growing up. Uh, that really inspired me to think about my place in the world and being a youth leader. Um, and I want to thank CWPPP uh, for the work and exact, you know, accepting me as an advisory board member because I was probably the most unlikely, likely person uh, mm -hmm. to serve in that capacity because I'm the most unlikely person to be in elected office. And so I want to carpent. I can't even say the word today, I'm really tired, uh, but basically take my remarks in three different sections. And one is how I got to this point, um, why I think more and more people should get public policy or gender leadership or ethnic studies or organizing degrees, um, because it's incredibly important in the work that we do, but it's also incredibly important in the work that the people around us do to help us do the job that we do. I don't care if any elected tells you this, um, because I'm going to tell you this, that we cannot do our work without the advocacy organizations that are working on issues from reproductive justice all the way to mass ending mass incarceration. Uh, we cannot do this work without um, the staff that we have in our offices. I actually have uh, two MPA uh, graduates um, in my staff, um, and they help me shape my policies and my agenda, even though I'm pretty strong-willed in the terms of the things that I'd like to do, they, they help make it all make sense. So how did I become a senator? And I, I like to thought, thank Dr. Jefferson, Isaiah Jefferson, because she called me a representative a moment ago, and that was true. I was a representative for two years. <laughs> it's okay. uh, I'm really proud to be one of the few people that have actually served both in the House and the Massachusetts Senate. And in 2018, when I ran, I ran not because I felt prepared, not because I felt seen, 
Um, I actually ran six months after the death of my youngest brother. Um, my brother was killed in Boston, um, coming out of a Boston nightclub. And although Michael wasn't the first person that I'd lost to gun violence, I had spent 15 years of my life post Wellesley really thinking about being a, a good citizen. And I thought that being a good citizen was becoming a youth worker and a nonprofit executive. And frankly, um, when my brother was killed, I was sitting in a seat of great privilege as a, a leader of a community center in Roxbury who had for 15 plus years in my whole life really work to improve the quality of life for Boston's young people because people had did it for me. And I saw how much difference uh, growing up in the Dudley Triangle, which was the most environmentally and economically disadvantaged community and neighborhood in Boston, that just one caring adult, the difference that one caring adult or one great youth organization or one great education at a local high school could do to change your life. Um, my mom was a teen single immigrant mother. She had come from Cape Verde in 1977. And my father who wasn't really active in my life uh, was incarcerated and then deported. In fact, all of the men in my life, all my brothers had did some type of uh, time in the criminal legal system. And so I was faced with this opportunity, I think, of responsibility and also just sheer chaos. And I think the paralyzation of grief, where I had to ask myself, what was my comp contribution to the world post Michael's death? Um, what was I going to do better? What was I going to do more of? And uh, I came to the consensus that I should run for office after being encouraged by so many people that I'd worked with for many years. There was like an opportunity, the person who was in a state rep seat, even though I didn't know how to write a bill, I didn't know how to run for office. I was running for DA and he approached me and said, you know, you'd be a great candidate to run for office. And I said, how is that? People like me, people with life stories like mine, growing up in the inner city, um, having a, a parent who was incarcerated and deported, having siblings um, who had been incarcerated and having a sibling who had been murdered. Um, how do we fit in this role of the Massachusetts legislature? I had only been to the state house once in my life. And that was a few years prior to help work on victims compensation, which was something uh, that I really believed in because I had lost so many other friends and people who were uh, family members or friends that I thought that Massachusetts could do better. And then when I was faced with that same reality, I was able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And so I finally decided to run. I went to Emerge Boot Camp, uh, which I recommend Emerge, but I don't recommend a boot camp because only 48 hours or less, actually, we had 10 hour days. So 20 hours of learning about politics in a crash course uh, wasn't really good enough uh, to really understand the, the intricacies and complexities of running for public office, but it still helped me. It gave me the confidence. And in 2018, I ran, I beat four men. I set a record in my district with over 10,000 people coming out to vote. And I won on the same night as uh, former U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and Representative Nika Elugardo. And it was the first time in Massachusetts history where four Black women won on the same night. <laughs> so we made history. And I think, you know, part of my story is meant to inspire people to understand that um, you don't have to be sort of what society deems as the perfect candidate. And you don't have to be someone uh, who is already uh, neck deep in politics to understand that you deserve and we deserve a more multilingual, multicultural, and multifaceted elector, elected body, whether that's at school committee, whether that's at a town meeting or town select boards, or whether that's at city councils like the city council in Boston, whether that's the state legislature, there's still room for everyday people to do extraordinary things. Um, and so that's my story and that's how I got here. And I was in the house for four years. I passed six bills. 
I was the lead author of the police reform bill. Um, and this is coming from a woman who didn't know how to write a bill. But advocacy organizations and advocates from my community, many of whom had MPP degrees and MPA degrees or legal degrees, all joined to help me get what was in my heart uh, to get done in Massachusetts out on paper. And so don't be afraid um, to choose a graduate degree because you feel like you're not fully equipped. Um, this is the reason why people get advanced degrees is that you're learning and you're a work in progress to make it happen. Um, I wanna say a couple more points about uh, the Massachusetts legislature um, because we are desperate uh, for diversity there that is growing, uh, but not growing at a fast enough pace. And I just wanna share some facts with you. So. There have been over 20,000 men who have run and won uh, for office in Massachusetts, while there's been only 221 plus women um, at the state legislature level. 20,000 and 220. This year, we have 63 women serving in the Massachusetts House and Senate. It's now finally 30% but women make over 50% of our state population. When it comes to women of color, there are four black women, four Latinx women, one trans person, there are two Asian women, and there are three Brazilian women. Mm -hmm. When it comes to men, there are seven Latino men, four black men, and we finally got our first Republican black male. So out of that group, we make up the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus, and we make up the Asian Caucus, um, which is no more uh, than less than 30 people out of 200 legislators. Uh, Massachusetts is a very diverse state. Um, communities like Boston and other cities, and UMass has always been an urban institution where people of color or people of different backgrounds felt comfortable to go. I do not represent UMass, but UMass was the first place where I took my dual enrollment class when I was in high school and I knew that I could succeed in college. And it was a place where any given day you can walk on the campus and hear uh, dozens and dozens of languages and different cultures because it is an institution for the people by the people. So as you can share, as you can see from what I've shared about our body, I wanna give you some census data to share why it's also important for people to consider um, working in public policy or public administration or public leadership. In 2020, those identifying as white and not Hispanic or Latino declined from 76% to 67% in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Yet our elected body in the legislature remains about 97% uh, Caucasian. Since, 60, six, since 1867, uh, when there was the first African-American elected to our legislative body during reconstruction, there have been only 48 black and Latino elected members. Hmm. Now Massachusetts is a leading uh, state legislature. Many of uh, the things that we have passed in Massachusetts have led other legislatures um, to pursue. Uh, Massachusetts founding fathers, many of them went on to not only write documents and lead in other states, but lead this country in the formation of this country. And so where you're not represented has dubious um, impact on the communities that we're meant to serve and on the issues that we hope are collective about equity and justice, but not always the case when you're not in the room. Um, and I'll end by saying, you know, it's been really hard to serve in the Massachusetts legislature. Um, it's not a place that I necessarily see myself every day, um, but what makes it worth it, what makes it exciting, and what makes me want to get an MPA degree this year and apply um, is because I see the ways in which we help people every day um, to make their quality of life better in the Commonwealth whether that's improving housing, improving education, next year, free community college. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a bill on uh, making sure that even if you're underdocumented, regardless of your status, you can get financial aid. This mm -hmm. is the type of work that elected officials do 
um, that can really make a difference. And although we always haven't been present Mm -hmm. and we're not present to the capacity that I believe our brilliance uh, dictates, I do believe that even when you elect one or when Mm -hmm. you elect the 24 or when you elect the five AAPI members of our body, um, you are making a huge difference. And it starts all with being knowledgeable and educated and interconnected. Um, And I think that that's what a graduate degree does. A lot of people think it's just the the coursework and the paper you get at the end, but the lifelong relationships that you make in graduate programs, like uh, the two that we've discussed today, one a certificate and one a fuller um, graduate program, but they are tied together, (laughs) Mm -hmm. is to make sure that you know that the relationships that you make, the knowledge that you learn, the internships that you partake in, um, some at uh, local legislative offices, um, really makes a difference not only in your life, but in your families and communities' life, but it also makes a difference in our lives. Uh, We are always looking for great people who want to make a difference in our Commonwealth. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of tonight's conversation. And I hope that you're inspired a little bit to think about graduate programs and then running for office. Um, And then if you're not interested in running for office, that you help someone else great uh, become a great politician or an elected in elected service. And if anyone would like to communicate with me after, I'm just going to put my information in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Miranda. Um, You know, your words are always words that I personally heed, take very seriously, ponder over. um, And I know that everyone really took a lot from what you had to say this evening. And again, you know, thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Very much appreciate it. And please take advantage of the information in the chat um, if you want to contact Senator Miranda um, later on. Um, You know, um, Before I go on, one of the things I would like to do is make sure that I recognize um, our external advisory board um, members. Um, You are, if you are in the room, please, you know, raise your hand, say hello. Um, And also um, any of our former, as well as present distinguished public service fellows. And um, again, if we have any, and I know that for instance, uh, Charlotte Golda Ritchie is both um, has been a emeritus. Bo- she's a board emeritus board member for our external advisory board, and just recently um, served as our interim board chair. And she also was a distinguished public service fellow. And I know that we also have faculty. Um, Yvonne Spicer, I know, is in in the room this evening. So for all of any of those categories, would you just raise your hand or do a holler so that we know you're in the house? I know there's someone someone here. I haven't heard a holler. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And it's good to see you all and Celia, Kiki, everybody. Thank you. And Liz, of course, Senator Miranda's, you know, amazing, right? Thank you. Yes, and I also want to recommend we have some former students also um, here as well. And again, thank you for joining us this evening. We could not do this um, without you. Um, I then like to move on to what I think um, is something um, important. Um, Senator Miranda, are you still are you still here? Thank you. I think she might have gone off. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do um, now moving forward is I'd like to um, take the time for you to hear from our um, former, one of our former students, um, Alana Hilton. And Alana, um, I'd love you to share your experience as a student um, in both the GLPP and the um, MPA program as a, as a GLPP, MPA GLPP student, it would be great again to share your experiences in terms of what you gained from the program and also a little bit about the work that you're doing now and also any community engagement activities you'd like to um, tell us more about as well that you're involved in. 
Absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for inviting me. I'm always um, excited to have an opportunity to talk about the GLPT program. It's been pivotal, pivotal, uh, pivotal tool in my career development, and I'm always happy to talk about it and encourage others like myself to pursue a, a career in public service. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a 2022 grad, Dorchester native, native and advocate. I'm a first generation American, and I applied to the GLPP MPA program because I wanted to advance my career and gain respect in the workplace as much as for more altruistic reasons, such as wanting to make a difference in my communities. Uh, the first thing I would like to speak about is the diversity of the cohorts. I had the unique opportunity of being part of two cohorts, both of which were diverse in representation from many, if not all, protected class groups. This allowed me to instantly feel comfortable sharing my views with others and learning from members of my cohorts, which was extremely important to me, especially when addressing sensitive topics. Both my fellow cohort members and the faculty and staff at the GLPP program were extremely inviting and supportive through times of heightened anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic and remain part of my network today. The curriculum through classes like contemporary American public policy and research methods will give you the detailed understanding of government and politics, as well as the historic and current impact of women, minorities, and under, other rep, underrepresented groups within our communities while also giving you the framework and critical thinking skills to understand and evaluate inequity and construct, confront structural racism. The ability to observe issues from an intersectional lens has changed the way I approach situations because I realized that people may simultaneously identify and struggle with the difficulties of more than one protected class group. The marginalization of Black women and women of color in general in public service, for instance, is a good example because we must fight for the rights of all women in the workplace while simultaneously confronting and overcoming racial barriers. One of the assignments, an intersectionality-based policy analysis, excuse me, one of the assignments, intersectionality-based intersectionality policy analysis, opened my eyes into exactly how much overlap there can be among protected class groups in the real work that would be required to reach equity. I wrote my paper on the lack of affordable housing in Boston, which is an issue I faced myself. The curriculum also offers classes like gender leadership and power focused on building leadership skills in diverse environments. The second year MPA curriculum gives you more of the foundational tools with classes like HR and public management and analytics to ensure you have the knowledge to identify and correct issues in the workplace. Sort of the nuts and bolts or foundation is a good way to look at it. Currently, I work in the affirmative action department of my agency monitoring our workforce goals and hiring trends. Like many other public agencies, although we are meeting our goals for overall hiring of minorities and women, it is not reflected in upper management and the executive levels. There is a lot, a lot of work to do to reach parity. We need more women of color in decision-making roles. Women belong in any room decisions are being made, even more so when those decisions impact the communities we serve. Without representation, there's no movement to challenge systems built on structural racism and influence change in our organizations and communities. We must put ourselves in positions to not only have a seat and a voice at the table, but to shake the table if need be. Okay. Another thing that is happening in the workplace right now that you should be aware of is that there is a wave of retirement. This opens up positions and opportunities to get fresh talent in these roles. Having more women and minorities who are educated and possess skills to be innovative leaders is the future, and that could be you. Since completing the program, I've taken the time to explore my options, but ultimately decided I'm happy with my current employer. The skills I've gained from the GLPP MPA program gave me the negotiation skills and educated I need to request a great increase to my current position, which increased my pay to be more equitable with colleagues in similar roles. It also earned me a spot on our DEI committee. In addition to that, I was appointed as the committee chair for our employee resource groups. Utilizing information I learned through the coursework, I wrote the policies and procedures for the operation of the groups and will be implementing them for the first time this fall. I was also able to request that my employer pay for training at Mass Commission Against Discrimination as a condition of my continued employment, all tools and skills that I learned through the GLPP MPA program. As women of color, education is a tool and can also be a defense because the more you know, the less opportunity there is for you to be silenced in the workplace. 
In closing, we all know you can't do today's jobs with yesterday's methods and be in business tomorrow. You have to be the change agent you want to see. Thank you so much. Ayanna. That was a really wonderful, wonderful um, presentation of what Thanks. you gained from the program and more fully what you're doing right now. And you are clearly making an impact to, to say the least. So, and again, I just want to also mention, Elena was a really fabulous student. I had her in, oh, in my classes and um, she rocked in, in many, in many, many ways. Thank you so, so much. Mark. You're welcome. And um, Michael, I'm turning it over to you now. Thank you, Lori. For this part of the program, we'd like to tell um, you um, who are interested in um, the MPA program or the GLPP track of the MPA program, a little bit about um, what the program is about, uh, the courses you take, um, what the concentration entails, uh, how you apply, um, and uh, what the experience will be. And for that, we'll have Associate Director Muna Killingback and Graduate Program Administrator Jack Lee. Jack and Muna. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, are you able to see my uh, PowerPoint? My yes. Oh, yes. okay. Um, so this is just a general slide to talk about, you know, um, our contact information. If you have any, you know, um, any questions after this session, feel free to always contact public.affairs at umb.edu. Uh, I'm Jack Lee. I'm the graduate program administrator for the Department of Public Policy. Who you heard from was Dr. Michael Johnson, who's the graduate program director. And then um, Muna Killingback is my colleague, who is the assistant program director of the GLPP program. So um, for this section, uh, we're going to talk about three programs. Um, you could, you know, make your decisions on the one that works for you. Um, Muna is going to present about the standard uh, GLPP program, which is a one-year program, and you get a GEO Gender Leadership and Public Policy Certificate out of it. I'm going to talk about the MPA program, which is a uh, the standard MPA program, which is um, a two-year program, and you get a MPA degree out of it, and it's a much more broader public management focus. And then I'm also going to talk about this, you know, two-in-one program, which is uh, the MPA GLPP program, which is also a two-year program, but it's it's a uh, bank for the buck a value program. Um, in addition to getting the MPA degree you could also get a GLPP certificate out of it for in just two years. So um, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Muna Killenbach, who's going to talk about the standard GLPP program, and we'll just go through it. Uh, Muna, feel free to introduce yourself and you can go. <laughs> Muna. I think she might have disconnected. <laughs> Anyways, I, I could go through my section first, uh, and then uh, we could turn it back over to Muna. Um, so to apply to the MPH and MPH LPP program, we're very much straightforward. Um, we only require four documents. Um, a, the first document is the statement of purpose, which is uh, 1,500 words. Um, and the, it's a two-parter. Uh, the first part is to talk about the reason you want to join the UMass Boston MPA program. Uh, that's 300 words, and this is in relation to your uh, academic background, your work experience, and your career goals. Um, the second part is to describe your personal qualities and development and how they've uh, influenced your career choice. Um, the second document is your official transcripts. Uh, some of our applicants are, you know, only have an undergrad degree. Some of them have a graduate degree. If you have undergrad, uh, undergrad upload is just fine. If you have a master's degree already, we just want uh, all of it. <laughs> and then um, the third document is the letter of recommendations. Um, we require three documents for that. Um, our preference is uh, one is from a professor or educational standpoint, and the other two is from a uh, you know work experience standpoint. But that is not a requirement. If you want to do three work experience uh, letter of recommendations, we are fine with that. Um, the fourth one, uh, resume. Uh, we just request that you um, have a most up-to-date resume before submitting. And then um, the other two, which is the GRE scores. Uh, some applicants um, prefer to submit a GRE score, but uh, since the pandemic, this has been optional in our program. So 
you are free to not sub, uh, submit a GRE score and it will not have a um, negative impact on your application. Um, for the international uh, applicants, uh, some in some countries, we, uh, UMass Boston requires an English exam. So um, after this presentation, I, I'll share this you know, PowerPoint with you and feel free to click that link and it'll tell you which English tests are required. You could select from a few and you only need to take one with a minimum um, score. Now to talk about the uh, standard MPA program, uh, very straightforward. Uh, pretty much every semester, you only take two full-time courses and two weekend workshops. Um, I'll tell you more about the scheduling at once we get to the F, uh, FAQ section. Um, yeah, uh, and then in the summer, you take one course, and in your second year, you take uh, two full-time courses and two weekend workshops as well. And then in your final semester, you only take two courses. One is a standard full-time course, and the last one is a, um, a uh, capstone. Now, the difference uh, and what we're pushing is the MPA GLPP program, which is the value you know program that I'm talking about, and that is... In addition to getting an MPA at the end of the two years, you can also get a GLPP certificate out of it. And it's the same cost as the um, standard MPA program. Uh, what's different is that the curriculum is a bit different. Um, in your first year, you take GLPP courses, uh, two full-time courses, and then, um, a fall internship for the first semester, uh, two full-time courses and two, uh, and one uh, internship in the second semester. And if you do, both of the internships in your first year, fall one and spring one, you'll get the MPA, uh, you'll get the uh, GLPP certificate. Um, and that's optional. If you don't want the GLPP certificate and you want to opt out of it, um, you could take a approved three credit course in spring instead of the two internships. Uh, you'll still get the MPA degree, but you won't get the GLPP certificate. In the second year, uh, you just hop over to MPA courses. Um, you take our MPA courses and you will not have to do the um, weekend workshops. So pretty much uh, two full-time courses um, in each of the semesters. And at the end of it, you'll graduate with a um, MPA degree or a GLPP certificate if you do the two internships. Now, um, money talks. So I put in a uh, you know a tuition slide. Um, for in-state students, uh, we're fairly affordable because we're, uh, you know, UMass Boston is a state uh, university. For the total cost of a uh, MPA or MPA GLPP um, degree, uh, it's 28000 and that could fluctuate depending on the economy, but it's fairly around that price. Uh, I would say you could get a degree at for thirty grand. Um, for the out-of-state students, it costs a bit more. Um, it costs around 56000 for the degree and but uh, you also get a discount if you're in the New England area so that'll bring it down to 50 grand if you're um, out of state but still in the New England area um Luna are you still there I could go yes can you hear me down. now can you yeah. hear me now okay okay right. you can go well you can continue and then I can do my part thank oh, you oh yeah so much. I'm already outside uh, the next section is the FAQ so oh, okay. I'll give you the floor for the standard GLPP mm -hmm. program which is a one-year program Oh, okay. Now that's now it's on to me. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you, thank you so much, Jack. Yeah, sorry about the glitch. I'm um, I'm oh, I'm actually um, traveling for a, a, a family problem, so I'm out in a very rural place right now. So it reminds me that r rural areas have completely different policy issues sometimes than um, urban ones too. But anyway, um, so welcome everyone, and thank you so much. Um, to Senator Miranda and Lori and Michael and Jack and Alana who presented and uh, Dean Dean uh, Adozi also for for um, speaking tonight. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about about the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Graduate Certificate Program now, which uh, is a two semester program, one academic year. You start in September, you finish in May, and you have about a five year um, five week <laughs> five year five week uh, gap in the between the two semesters. So um, why would someone want to do the graduate program um, instead of the Master of Public Administration uh, program? Well, there are different reasons our students come to us. Um, one is that they already have advanced degrees. A lot of people um, 
have a master's degrees in teaching or social work. Some people already have um, JDs in law or, um, or, or public, you know, so not, not public policy per se, but like health policy, for example, and they want to do a deeper dive into gender and more intersectional perspectives. Um, the other reason is people aren't really ready or, or sure that they want to um, do a two-year master's program and they don't want to commit to that yet. So the, the gender leadership and public policy graduate certificate is a really good way of testing the waters to see whether public policy really is what you want to do. Um, our students can, our GLPP graduate certificate students can apply um, during the year they're in the graduate certificate program to continue into the um, MPA, the Masters of Public Administration GLPP track. And if they apply and are accepted, they can continue um, and do one additional year and earn the MPA degree as if that, you know, with, along with the other students who had applied at the outset for the MPA GLPP track. So students who are sure that they want to do an MPA and they're they're interested in intersectional perspectives of public policy and and social justice and advocacy like that's a that is a good track of the MPA program um, for those kind of students you can apply now if you're already sure that you want to do an MPA and you can select the GLPP track and um, Jack showed you the difference in coursework and we can look at that again briefly but. Um, so that's that's um, those are the reasons people would choose to do a certificate rather than apply for the MPA right away. Um, we, we also have students who want to um, do the GLPP program who aren't sure what kind of further master's degrees they might do. So some of our students um, definitely go on to do the MPA program. Um, a few of our students have gone on to do another master's program at UMass Boston that also accepts 15 of our um, graduate certificate credits. That's the critical ethnic and community studies master's program. For, for some of our students, that has been the right fit. And other students, uh, cert, right now, some of our students have been accepted to um, law school or other kinds of um, master's degree programs as well. So, But we have this um, close connection with the Master of Public Administration program. And that's why we have the Master of Public Administration GLPP track and the GLP, and the, and the GLPP certificate with the linkage to the MPA to continue on and finish that in one year. So we have many students doing that every year and they have find it, found it to be a really great combination of, um, of, pub, you know, of looking at, at public policy issues through an intersectional lens and doing a deep dive and um, gaining those skills of analysis and um, advocacy too, and gaining an advocacy and policy toolkit. And that's what the GLPP graduate certificate program, which is the same curriculum as of the first year of the MPA GLPP program will give you. So also, like I said, it's less commitment. It's le it costs less to do the, um, it's very eco economical to do the online program. Um, only 10,500 approximately for all the fees and tuition um, for, the, for the GLPP graduate certificate. So um, students who apply for the MPA GLPP track can opt to, to do the online program. And in fact, next year, I believe we will, um, because of different um, other programming priorities right now, I think we'll only be offering the GLPP certificate program online. So um, that will be a cost savings for many of our stu many students who um, to do that. Um, Again, uh, our graduate certificate program has a very high level of diversity in it because we draw from these different kinds of groups of people who come for different reasons. We have a lot of people who come mid-career or even late career. So we have a lot of diversity in every possible dimension in race, ethnicity, academic backgrounds, um, um, and also age and, and professional um, experience, levels of professional experience, and also um, sexual orientation, gender diversity in every way too. So, um, okay, um, Jack, would you go to the next slide please for me? Do you have it? Oh. oh, thank you. So these are the six uh, courses that you would do to do the gender leadership and public policy uh, graduate certificate, women in American politics and policymaking, which is really um, has really um, shifted over the years to now be more like uh, about gender in American politics and policy making, um, contemporary American public policy issues, and Dr. Lori Nasaya Jefferson, director, teaches that program, and they do all kinds of interesting things like uh, political uh, autobiography. They do some you know self analysis too in that program, in that class, which I think students really enjoy and learn a lot about themselves and how they 
fit into the big world. I think Lori could talk more about that if you want more information later. Uh, research methods for policy analysis gives our students uh, a critical lens to, um, to be people who, people in uh, policy leadership roles who commission le or research and also do research themselves. Um, it also helps you to find the um, flaws in research that you might be working with. Leadership and organizations, gender, power, and authority was developed um, uniquely for the GLPP program by Professor Tracy Wallach. That course gives our students tools to navigate the psychodynamics of organizations when they take on leadership roles or at any, any, when, at any level in an organization. And our students often comment that they have learned a lot um, that's been very useful in that class as they have, you know, um, take it on in different roles or move to new organizations. And lastly, the internship is really important part of our GLPP certificate curriculum. It's a two semester course, fall internship and spring internship. The bulk of the work in the internship class is the actual internship itself. And it is possible for students to um, do an internship while they work full time. How they do this is that they either do an internship where they work, um, and many of our students have done that. They often take on a special project, often having to do with diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism. Maybe they develop a manual, they organize a training program, um, or they can do a client survey. Anyway, our students have done really creative things where they work, and this also helps to showcase different skills that they may not have been able to use at work before. Uh, or they can do a research internship, and a lot of students have really enjoyed um, trying their hands at like uh, you know, policy research um, at a think tank or a research center. Sometimes we have students at our, the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy doing research. And the third way they uh, full-time workers can do an internship is by just uh, modifying their schedule and working longer two days and then having a, an afternoon off um, or a day off. Uh, you know, our students really get a lot out of the internship um, because it is meant to bridge the gap between where they are now in their careers and where they want to be, where the next step in their careers, or even in their life, their, um, in their work as advocates and activists as well. So it bridges the gap in terms of experience, skills, and network. Um, so that's a, and many of our students do find that that has been um, life changing for them, the, the internship. Um, but MPA GLPP students who opt to apply for the MPA GLPP track at the outset do have another alternative. Um, they don't have to do the internship, the two semester internship, and can opt for a one um, semester uh, approved elective, policy elective instead. So that would that is what we would recommend for students who are absolutely um, on the career track they want to be on and they know that um, they feel like they don't need to gain this kind of like additional experience or, or exposure to um, policy work. So um, I think, is there another slide for me, Jack, or did I cover uh, it? All? No, that's it. Oh, okay. I just want to mention a little bit about our admissions. We have a slightly different admissions policy. We only require um, two letters of recommendation um, for the GLPP certificate. Um, the letters, the, the, the application questions are quite similar, but the rest is quite similar. The resume, the transcripts, um, et cetera. And we also have, in, for students in the GLPP graduate certificate program and the first year of the MPA GLPP track, we do invite our accepted students to apply for your, either a Betty Tame or a Polly Logan scholarship. Um, and we look, um, we, we award these scholarships based on financial need. They are, um, they range between $500 and $2,500, which can be quite a you know, significant chunk of the bill if you're, you know, if you're looking at the online program that costs $10,500 a year and you get a scholarship for $2,500. Um, this year we, we, we have um, larger amounts um, of scholarship money than usual. So this is a good year to apply if you're, if you're interested in getting some financial aid. So. Thank you, everyone. I think I'm done with my part. <laughs> so I look sure. forward to uh, hearing some questions. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, I know we shared a lot of information in this presentation. Mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. going to, you know, after this yeah. uh, session is over, we're going to do a recap email. 
send you all the documents that we've presented mm -hmm. or put into the chat and then you could you know look mm -hmm. over it. and if you have any questions feel free to reach out to us uh we are always happy to help and for my section which is the final section i'm just going to go over some you know faq frequently asked questions uh of our program um so uh for the mpa or mpa glpp program which both are two-year programs um our final deadline is on July 1st. So okay. that is under one month for the fall 2023 um, emission cycle, uh, which you know uh, might be a short time for some people, uh, but we will, um, if you cannot make it for this you know, emission cycle, we will open the fall 2024 emission cycle around uh, November, and that will last until uh, June of uh, 2024. Um, and Jack, Jack, can I just interject for a minute? Yeah. Um, it's my understanding that the MPA GLPP students have into, have into July 15th, but the regular MPA students have to July 1st. Isn't that correct? Oh, right. That is the new policy. That is correct. Uh, if you want to apply to the MPA GLPP program, uh, it will go until July 15th, not July 1st. July 1st mm -hmm. is for the standard MPA. Right, and the GLPP deadline is also July 15th. Right, right. All right, thank you for that, Lori. Uh, so for the MPA program, the general schedule is um, each class is going to happen either on a Monday or a Wednesday, and it goes from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Um, you have the option to uh, attend it remotely or in person. If you want to attend it remotely, it's to resume. And this hybrid you know, program that we're going for is called Beacon Flex. So it, it's up to you. You could go to class in person or you could just uh, zoom in. Uh, for MPA GLPP students, uh, you might have recollected that I've talked about if you want the certificate, you will have to do the two internships. But even if you, you know, if you want to opt out of it, you'll still get an MPA degree out of it. You, you just won't get the certificate. Um, now, I know a lot of our applicants are, you know, state workers. Um, accepted students could qualify for a graduate assistantship. Um, we accept one to two students per cohort, so it's fairly competitive. But if you're, you know, accepted, um, this will cover 50% of your yearly tuition. Uh, so say if you apply for the MPA GLPP program, um, that'll cut down the tuition, assuming you're an in-state student, from 28 grand to about 14 grand. And students also get a biweekly stipend out of it. Um, there's also, you know, many uh, applicants who are state and government employees. And that gives you a chance you might be able to qualify for financial aid uh, via UMass Boston or through um, your HR department. And a UMass Boston tuition waiver for um, state or government or employees are usually $108 per credit. Now, uh, some students, because they're working full time, they, they always ask me the question, can I take the programs part time? And that is definitely a yes. Um, if you don't think you can handle off the, you know, the full time courses, you are um, eligible to take the program part time. It might take you longer than well, it'll definitely take you longer than two years to complete the program, but you can take it at your own pace. And it'll still cost the same at the very end. We, I believe, UMass Boston charges on a per credit basis. Now, um, this slide is a little bit incorrect. Um, the deadline for the MPA GLPP program and the GLPP program is July fifteenth for um, fall twenty twenty three emissions. If you're applying for the standard uh, MPA program, that is July first. Uh, I think we could open the floor up for any you know questions, students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Michael, feel yeah. free to you know facilitate yeah. that and oh. uh, yeah, when you want. Oh, question? could I just add one thing? Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, like, even though the deadline, the final deadline is July 16th, we urge people to start your application as soon as possible because there can be delays, and um, so we just think it's the best thing for everyone if you could start your application like as soon as you are you possibly can, you know. But that is the final that the final final deadline is July 16th. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Feel free to facilitate the you know Q and A section, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there is any. Yeah, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Muna.
Um, I'd like now to open the floor to any questions um, our perspective students uh, may have about any aspects of our, of our programs or the application process or anything else. Any questions? But don't be shy. <laughs> and I'll see if anyone has their hand in the air. Well, they can put questions in the chat as well. If yes, please. <laughs> and even if you don't have any questions during this section, you know, you could feel free to email us after the session. We are always happy to help through email as well. Public.affairs at umb.edu. And then um, if you have any GLPP questions, uh, I think you could email Muna Killing back at uh, umb.edu. Uh, we'll, we'll share off the, you know, the documents and, you know, um, contacts after the session as well. So Muna, Lori, and Jack, I thought I could uh, take a minute to talk about uh, the capstone requirement. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, so one thing that distinguishes our MPA program, including the MPA GLPP track, is um, the requirement that every student uh, complete um, an original research project. Um, this project is, is called um, Capstone. It, uh, it's uh, pretty substantial. It's a six credit course that uh, students take in uh, the spring semester of their second year. Um, it requires some knowledge of how to design a research project, how to choose a research question, how to engage a client, collect and analyze data, and how to um, identify something that is new and meaningful for practitioners and researchers. Um, this is uh, a pretty big responsibility. Um, it's uh, not the easiest thing to do, but students who come out of it say that uh, they um, are different for having posed and answered a non-trivial research question that can be actually relevant to their work or the things they want um, to do in the future. And what I'd like to do is uh, share, if I could, um, some titles of the kinds of, of projects that um, our students pursue for capstones. Um, the first title on the list how do local government nonprofit policies and programs impact Afghan refugee integration by Norhan al Shihabi? Um, one, I believe, um, one of our best um, capstone um, awards um, for this uh, past spring. Uh, I attended all the capstone presentations and uh, they were really, really good. Um, we saw a uh, capstone on unmet needs of LGBTQ plus students among high school students in Massachusetts. Um, we saw a case study of the uh, uh, response by residents of Martha's Vineyard to um, the emergency migration from Florida, uh, racial equity in Boston's homeless response system, um, and even rural agrarian populist organizing, um, which also I think uh, shared um, the best capstone award. Um, so, uh, Jack, you can put into the chat uh, the document, essentially, that has uh, capstone titles for the past three years. Yep, yep sure do. Um, so what I want to share with all of you is that uh, these capstones are the product of, uh, of, of two years of work, um, learning how to do quantitative and qualitative analysis, uh, research design, a uh, deep understanding of municipal finance, of um, public management, of HR, and many other topics. And what comes out of it is uh, a report that can change the way that um, students think about uh, their careers and uh, knowledge that can help their employers uh, do things a little different. What I have on the screen here are capstones for 2022 and 2021. And I think you'll get a sense that um, whatever your passion is, whether it's related to the job you have now or the kind of impact that you'd like to have in the future, um, you will uh, have the opportunity to, to choose that topic, to workshop it, and to develop it into um, um, a really sort of impactful research opportunity. 
Well, you know, Michael, thank you for that. And um, you've uh, you've inspired me to um, share a little bit about some of the um, final presentations um, that we have in our programs. We don't have a capstone, but we do um, we do have a, a policy course where students have to create an intersectionally based policy analysis. And this is something that is a real strong strength of the GLPP certificate program. Um, our students learn about, you know, what is policy? What is the reason for policy? What are the ways in which we evaluate the effectiveness of policy? But in addition to that, we teach them those traditional ideas and methods, but we also say that our program is really moving toward making sure students know how to analyze policy, particularly as it relates to their equity um, impact. And so some of the um, you know, final um, intersectionally based policy analysis papers addressed, um, you know, one was a case for federally funded and state funded comprehensive sex education. We had another a student who did um, intersectionally based policy analysis relating to LGBTQ discrimination. Um, we had another student do policy response to the rape kit um, backlog. And we had another student who worked on Black women's safe spaces, saving Black-owned beauty salons, something that I don't think many of us, you know, think about. And we have had some incredible um, in internships. We've had um, interns who've worked for Mass Equality, um, the committee to elect um, Tram Nagoon, and also students who worked for Emerge, um, the organization that supports women running for office, the Massachusetts Caucus of Women Legislators, um, the uh, campaign to elect Sonia Chang Diaz, and also to do internships with her. We've had um, research work um, for our intersectionally based policy analysis relating to COVID-19, the gender pay gap. So as you can see, if you look at the programs and the, the um, topics that students are addressing in the MPA program and the GLPP program, it's amazing what they're doing. And I actually, you know, enjoy reading the papers and I enjoy the growth that our students gain through both of these programs. You, we see them at the beginning of their academic career, and then we see them at the end. And believe me, they're very savvy. And they, in many instances, put pressure on their employers to think differently as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lori. Um, I wanted to mention um, another uh, feature, a, a, a new feature of our MPA program. And this relates to um, uh, Jack's comments a little earlier about uh, financial aid. Uh, so that we, we said that the uh, Collins Center for Public <laughs> Management um, is one of, I guess, 11 centers in the McCormick Graduate School. And they are basically a, a, a public administration uh, in-house consulting shop. They take uh, requests for projects to do um, uh, performance assessment, um, uh, negotiating contracts, revising town charters, all the sorts of things that municipalities need to make their operations run. Um, and uh, uh, the director has uh, developed a, uh, a new fellowship through Collins Center. It uh, allows MPA students um, if they are accepted to uh, get a part-time job working on municipal uh, government consulting projects for two years with the Collins Center. So students who apply to the MPA program, which includes the MPA GLPP track, um, may be considered at their request um, for this uh, Collins Center Fellowship. And um, if you're accepted into the program, you'll get work experience on a variety of projects in Massachusetts cities and towns. The work will be virtual. You'll get paid $30 an hour and you'll be guaranteed an average of 18 hours a week over the course of the program. So this is a new program. It's uh, just for this year. Um, so it's not part of the official program application, um, but uh, Jack, you can put uh, the draft um, uh, fellowship announcement in the chat. And uh, if you are applying to the MPA GLPP program, um, let uh, Jack uh, and me know that you're interested in being considered for this fellowship. Thank you. And one thing I'd like to say, um, piggybacking on Michael um, Johnson's comment about the fellowship, the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy actually partners with the Collins Center on, we have a 
a diversity, equity, and inclusion, and anti-racist practice. And we've been working in a number of municipalities. And, you know, that may be a possibility for, for the fellowship. It's not necessarily promised, but I will say that, you know, this is some of the really exciting work that, you know, we do. And it's also possible that you could be a student in the GLPP program and also find ways in which you could um, do your internship um, you know, not just the fellowship, but your internship with the Collins Center. We do have, um, you know, some not students, but we have individuals that are part of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy who do spend time on these um, diversity, equity, and inclusion projects, which are extraordinarily exciting right now. So I wanted to you know, highlight that as well. So um, part of my job in the graduate as graduate program director um, is to do admissions. And uh, Lori, um, and I um, will we'll read um, every uh, application to the MPA GLPP program. And um, we promise to give every application um, its uh, fullest consideration. Um, mm -hmm. Both of us have lots of experience in what makes a good, strong application. And if you have any questions about the process or want to run some ideas uh, by us, um, don't hesitate to contact either of us and Jack can put our emails in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Well, first of all, I, I'd want to again, thank everyone. Um, and unless there's a burning question, um, I'd like to you know, thank everyone for joining us this evening. I have, and I know everyone else who has been part of this um, planning of this particular event was really, really very, very excited to have a time where we can provide you with information about all of our programs, but also underscore very, very heavily the importance of diversity in terms of our students joining our particular academic programs, but more so moving and utilizing the knowledge base that you have to make an incredible impact on all the persistent and intractable challenges that we face as diverse populations. You are poised to do this work and we need more and more of you to do it and to come to our programs, come to the programs that we offer will only make you a more incredible um, person to do the work. So again, you know, share what you've learned tonight with your contacts um, and your friends. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Michael, myself, Muna, and Jack, because we really would like to hear from you. Um, and normally what happens is questions pop up later and you know, feel free and comfortable to reach out to us. Um, I don't know whether Michael, you have any other closing thoughts or anything you'd like to add before we close up um, this evening. I'd just like to thank all of you for taking the time to um, come out to learn about um, our academic programs and uh, know that um, uh, UMass Boston is a university that uh, takes uh, learning, takes teaching and takes student success uh, very seriously because your success is our success. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to, I would be remiss, 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 if I didn't thank, again, the Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition, um, Celia Johnston Blue, and I think Junie, Jeannie Morrison is on as well um, for co-hosting this event. Um, again, Celia is my go-to when we're thinking about issues relating to diverse populations, women of color in Massachusetts. Um, again, and, you know, Celia, if you want to, you know, shout out about, you know, and ask people, they might want to join your organization. See us at maywalk.com. Thank you, everybody. Okay. It's nice Thank to be you. a part of this. Thank you so much, Celia, again, for co-hosting. Good evening and good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye -bye.